All right, well, again, let me just say that I, I do have a dual purpose for this um, sermon this morning. Uh, two things, maybe three, actually. Um, to exhort us to continue to grow in our understanding of the Bible, to learn a little bit about what scholasticism was all about, because that's what we're going to be looking at this evening, because I want to approach the topic that we're looking at this morning in the way that Turretin did, okay? Although, if you read Turretin, you're going to see it's really complicated stuff, so we're, going to, we're not going to be able to go into the depths that he went into. But I thought, well, if we're going to pick a topic, you know, uh, to deal with in a scholastic way, so to speak, why don't we pick one that's going to be very encouraging? Uh, because we're all faced right now with particular difficulties and trials, some of them great, some of them not as great. But during all these times, we are often tempted to think that uh, perhaps the Lord has abandoned us. Well, He hasn't, and He never will, and that's what we want to see. So, three purposes for this. And for our text, I want us to use one that has to do with the particular doctrine we're going to look at, and I think perhaps the strongest statement in Scripture that we have, that a true believer will never be lost, not because of us, not because we have the strength to persevere, but because God will make sure we do. He will never let go of us. And, uh, well, again, that's what the memory verse is all about. I don't want to distract you, but it's contained in the text we're looking at. So let me read for you John 10, verses 22 through 29. Now, at that time, the feast of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. By the way, no one, no one can take us away from God. That, that part of this terror is, is very clear. But the other point is, we're not going to want to jump out of that infinite hand either and fall away from the Lord. Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. Okay, well, I've already told you the three purposes of this uh, sermon, so I hope we don't get lost in the mix, okay? I think they, they will all blend together. Let me just start by saying this, that in 1 Corinthians 8.1, Paul writes, uh, writes this, Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. Now, many years ago, I heard a pastor teach from this passage that we shouldn't try to learn too much about what the Bible teaches because too much knowledge is going to make us conceited, okay? it's going to make us arrogant. We'll think that, we're, that we know everything, you know, know-it-alls, that we're better than everyone else because we know all these things and we will likely create divisions. Love, on the other hand, will do just the opposite. Love will heal division. So we should focus on growing in that instead. Now, let me just say that I agree that the second point is right. We do need to grow in biblical Christ-like love because love unites. It draws people together. It heals divisions. As we saw last week, you know, we may differ with fellow believers in a variety of issues, but if we believe that, that core belief, the foundational principles of the gospel, we are brethren, and we do need to love each other as brethren. But he was wrong about this first point, because Paul there is not speaking about biblical knowledge in general. You know, biblical knowledge is going to make you arrogant. But he's speaking about something much more specific. He's talking about those who had the knowledge that they could eat things that were sacrificed to idols. And they were looking down on their brethren who didn't believe that, and they were exercising their freedom in Christ to the detriment of their brethren. 
If they love their brothers and sisters as they should, they would use that knowledge, you know, again, that knowledge of what is permissible as believers, to help them instead of stumbling them. Now, this pastor I was talking about, he was wrong on that issue, but he also proved through his life and, and his ministry that knowing too little of what the Bible teaches can also go a long ways in creating division. And he actually did create a good deal of it. But my point is, is simply this. Biblical knowledge, what, what God teaches us in the Word, knowing that, is a good thing. It is true that those who know a lot can become arrogant, but that only means that they haven't learned you know, Christ as they should. Because true biblical knowledge humbles. It increases our love. It serves to unite Christ's people rather than to divide them. That's why Paul went everywhere teaching Christians what they should believe and what they should do. And if they did it right, they would be a unified body of believers serving the Lord. God gave us his word to teach us how we might do the right things, as Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.17, that we might be adequate, equipped for every good work. And that's why Peter encourages us to learn more of it in 2 Peter 3.18, as we've already read, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Now, tonight we're looking at the movement called scholasticism, as I've already said. And that, as Bob Godfrey will tell us this evening, is the Reformed response, or was the Reformed response, to the renewed attacks on Reformation teaching that came from various quarters, you know, a renewed Roman, Catholic, uh, Roman Catholicism, a renewed Lutheranism, a renewed Anabaptist, um, and actually there are several Anabaptist groups, and the Socinians, who were the sort of pre-liberals of the day. As he said, during the time of the Reformation, the Reformers, they were all the high caliber teachers, okay? And so they tended just to kind of mow over everybody else, but you know, when there is the, this, uh, re, this, I should say, this action of strong teaching, there's always going to be this reaction, and that's what we see this evening. Now, we spent several months looking at apologetics. Apologetics is a reasoned defense of the truth of Christianity to unbelievers to try to show them the objective truth uh, that the Bible is true, God exists, the Bible is His Word, we should believe and receive everything that it says. Scholasticism falls more under what we call polemics, more of an, an in-house discussion of what the Bible teaches. And I say in-house not absolutely because Socinians were not believers. The Roman Catholic Church, they've, they've rejected the gospel. They, they're not a true church either. I know that can kind of shock some people, but, but that is how we should view them but rather people who believe or accept the Bible as the authority. Polemics is debating within the bounds of Scripture what the Bible actually teaches. Now, one of the things that we should note about polemics is that when you engage in them, you quickly find yourself being pushed into deeper and deeper waters. Uh, several years ago, just as a personal example, I used to teach, uh, when I used to teach the adult Sunday school class, we would start at, at sort of a simple level, you know, and as we're, we're dealing with the same thing happens in the new members class for some reason, <laughs> okay? You start at a simple level, but then you get these questions that are, you know, ask for more specifics and maybe some other things that are related to that. And these questions, you know, tend to make the discussion more and more complicated. Uh, to the point sometimes in the adult Sunday school class where they say, wait a minute, you know, why do I need to know all these things? How am I going to teach these things to my children? Well, again, you may not be able to teach all this truth at the level the child can understand it, but as adults, we need to know what the Bible teaches as much of it as we possibly can. I mean, have you ever had a friendly discussion with someone on some particular point in the Bible, right? Maybe you disagree on it. And as you're discussing it, your conversation gets deeper and deeper and deeper. Complex questions require complex 
answers, sometimes a little bit more complicated than we, we would hope it would get. But this is how theology develops. This is how our understanding of the Bible develops in the history of the church. Do you realize at one time in the history of the church, it was enough to profess to be a Christian, and all you had to say is, Jesus is Lord, okay? <laughs> That's pretty simple. But as time went on and questions were raised, a fuller confession became necessary. Let me, let me give you an example. By the second century, the confession about Christ was expanded in the Apostles' Creed to read this way, I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. Okay, Jesus is Lord. There you got it. But there's more. Who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. Well, that's what the church was confessing because questions were being raised and, you know, the truth was being challenged. By the time we get to the fourth century, we read in the Nicene Creed, which was formulated to deal with certain... Um, heresies regarding who Jesus is, a, an even fuller statement. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, listen, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through Him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. And then it goes into the other details we get into from the Apostles' Creed. Incarnate by the Holy Spirit, the Virgin Mary crucified, suffered, died, third day rose again from the dead, and so forth. But then it doesn't stop there. As the doctrine of Christ continued to be attacked, it became necessary to fill this out even a little further in the Athanasian Creed, which, by the way, was not written by Athanasius because Athanasius lived in the 4th century, this creed actually originates from the 5th century as a very full uh, confession of Christ. It, it emphasizes his deity in virtually every way. And then it states certain things, and let me conclude this historic example with this. He says, or the confession says, but it is necessary for eternal salvation that one also believe in the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ faithfully. Now this is the true faith that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, is both God and human equally. He is God from the essence of the Father, begotten before time, and He is human from the essence of His mother, born in time, completely God, completely human, with a rational soul and human flesh, equal to the Father as regards divinity, less than the Father as regards humanity. Although he is God and human, yet Christ is not two but one. He is one, however, not by his divinity being turned into flesh, but by God's taking humanity to himself. He is one, certainly not by the blending of his essence, but by the unity of his person. For just as one human is both rational soul and flesh, so too the one Christ is both God and human. Sounds kind of complicated, doesn't it? Okay. And it goes on to say, he suffered, he ascended to hell, he arose from the dead, ascended to heaven, and gives all these other details. Why all this depth? Well, again, if you know the history of the church, you know the different questions that were being asked, the truths that were being challenged. How can we believe Jesus is one person, but yet he has two whole natures that are entire and separate, and yet we believe in this one Christ? Okay? Well, again, it does get complicated. And by the way, it is good that these questions were actually raised. It wasn't good for the people who raised them if they didn't you know, repent of their false beliefs. But it was good for those who defended it because it forced the church to study Scripture more carefully so that they might do what Paul exhorts Timothy to do, to study the Word of God, to present himself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. This is how systematic theology developed. Taking what the scripture says on any given topic, 
and bringing all those pieces together to reveal the whole picture. By the way, how many of you here who were here on Sunday evening, a couple of Sunday evenings ago, I think it's, well, it's a few now, remember what Derek Thomas talked about as what he thought was the most useful tool in interpreting Scripture, okay? Systematic theology. And the reason is because if we understand what the Bible teaches as a whole, it's easier to understand the parts. And that's the reason why the Westminster Divines wrote what's called the Shorter Catechism or any of the catechisms of the church were written to get certain foundational principles into our minds so that when we read the scriptures, we can understand from those principles what, what is being taught. It kind of keeps us going the right direction because as we're going to see this morning, passages of scripture can be understood differently. And they are understood differently. But we have to take what the Bible says as a whole to understand any one part of it. Now, with this in mind, let's consider what the Bible has to say about the perseverance of the saints. Now, the scholastics, if you read any of the scholastics, you'll find that they'll dive much more deeply into the, any, any topic, but into this topic, than we will have time to do this morning. But I thought we could kind of do a simple example of the way that Francis Turretin would approach a question and how he would resolve that question. And actually, if you look at Turretin, it's all just a series of questions and answers. But it's not a catechism, believe me. Uh, it's something you, would, you really won't be able to memorize. But if you do have a question on a particular topic that he addresses, uh, you will find him to be very full. So what would Turretin do? Uh, and this is what we do, too. When we're talking about any truth in God's Scripture, there's always a question we're asking, an argument we're making, trying to make a point, and then an application, okay? So first of all, Turton would state the question, okay? What is, what is really the issue here? What are we really talking about? Well, the question we want to ask this morning is this. Can a true believer lose their justification? And justification, remember, is everything. When it comes to getting to heaven, you can't get into heaven without justification. You need to be declared righteous by God. That can only be through faith in Christ. But once you have it, can you lose it? And in the end, fall away, be lost eternally. Now, I think in light of what several of us are facing now and what all of us will inevitably have to face one day, and even just the problems we face on a day-to-day -day basis, the answer to this question is very, very important. Well, having asked the question, he would then give a preliminary answer, okay? This we deny, okay, against our opponents. And what he would mean by that is we deny that a true believer can ever lose their justification and be eternally lost. Now, he's not just going to stop there, right? He's going to have to deal with the, with the question. So the next thing he would do is he would give us the argument of the opponent. And so let's think for a few moments. And here it's going to be a little bit tricky because as I read these passages, by the time I'm done reading them, you're going to think to yourself, hey, maybe a believer can lose their salvation. But there is an answer to these things. But let me just start by saying, and this is what Turretin would do, he would give a survey of what you know, the answers to these questions have been in the history of the church. Well, we know that there are those in the history of the church who have answered this question, yes, you can be justified but lose your salvation. Uh, one example would be Pelagius, who was a contemporary of, of Augustine. Now, a guy, a Pelagius believed this, that everyone would be judged on the last day. We certainly agree with him on that but not for the bad things they did. That's, that's kind of a strange thing, isn't it? But for the good that they failed to do. You know, maybe he wrapped it all up, you know, in, in one thing. Well, doing this bad thing means you're not doing this good thing, right? Even though the path of righteousness was open to everyone, only a few would manage to follow it exactly and be saved. Which means, at least in Pelagius' mind, that there are people who could follow it for a time and, yeah, they would be accepted into heaven, but then they could lose it. 
by stepping off that path, by failing to live up to God's standard. By the way, Charles Finney believed essentially that same thing, that you are only right with God as long as you live an exacting, perfect life, but as soon as you step off the path, you're lost, okay? So yes, you're, you can be justified and you can lose that justification. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that baptism which often takes place of infants, but also of adults, confers the grace of justification. At the moment you're baptized, you are justified. You are going to enter into heaven if you die. But that justification can be lost, and it most often is through mortal sin. You know, you, you, you're hedging that way as you commit the lesser sins, in their view, the venial sins that kind of prepare you for mortal sin, but eventually you... You commit a mortal sin and you kill that justification. And now you need to be saved again. You need to be justified again. So the second plank of justification, which for them is penance. R.C. Sproul writes this, for a person who has committed mortal sin to be restored to the state of salvation, in other words, to regain justification, they had to avail themselves of the sacrament of penance, which was performed by the church. Rome believes you can lose your justification. And if it's not restored by penance, you will perish in the end. But for our purposes this morning, let me give to you uh, John Wesley's argument. Okay, John Wesley, well-known Arminian, believed that you could lose your salvation. You know, um, his reasons are pretty much the same that are used by most people who don't believe that, that you know, that you're, I hate to put it this way, once saved, always saved, that, that's really not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is if you are a true believer, you will persevere in righteousness to the end of your life and you will enter into heaven. The once saved, always saved kind of thought is this. If God saves me, it doesn't matter what I do. I can sin all I want. I can live any kind of life I want and I'm still going to get into heaven. There are people who teach that and that is wrong. What we're talking about is the perseverance of the saint. If you are a true believer, you will persevere in righteousness to the end of your life. You, yeah, there will be those ups and downs, there will be those falls, but you will eventually enter into heaven. Now, John Wesley did not believe that. Again, and you'll recognize the verses that he used, but first of all, let's try to understand what he's talking about. For he, he first of all defines what he means by a Christian. He says, by the saints, I mean those who are holy, are righteous in the judgment of God himself. Well, that's justification. Those who are endowed with a faith that purifies the heart, that produces a good conscience, those who are grafted into the good olive tree, the spiritual invisible church, those who are branches of the true vine, of whom Christ says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who so effectually know Christ as by that knowledge to have escaped the pollutions of the world, those who see the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ and have been made partakers of the Holy Ghost, of the witness and fruit of the Spirit, those who live by faith in the Son of God, who are sanctified by the blood of the covenant, those to whom all or any of these characters belong, I mean by the term saints. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is John Wesley, he would deny this, but what he's done is he has mixed the definition of justification with those verses that talk about apostasy of those who never truly believed. And maybe you heard those references as I was reading, but those are the verses that, that he, I'm going to read in just a moment that he references. Now, secondly, he explains what he means by a Christian falling away. By falling away, we mean not barely falling into sin. This it is granted, they may. But can they fall totally? Can any of these so fall from God as to perish everlastingly? I am sensible either side of this question is attended with great difficulties, such as reason alone could never remove, therefore to the law and the testimony. Let the living oracles decide. And if these speak for us, we neither seek nor want further witness. So what, what, does he, what does he conclude from the Scriptures? He gives us, again, his initial response. On this authority of the Scriptures, 
I believe a saint may fall away, that one who is holy or righteous in the judgment of God himself may nevertheless so fall from God as to perish everlastingly. Now, I'm going to read for you several passages of Scripture, and as I've said, just kind of hang on, because these do seem to imply that a true believer can lose their salvation. You've heard them before. Maybe you've wrestled with them before. But let me read them. First of all, Ezekiel 18, verse 24. But when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, commits iniquity, and does according to all the abominations that a wicked man does, will he live? All his righteous deeds which he has done will not be remembered for his treachery which he has committed and his sin which he has committed for them, he will die. 1 Timothy 1, verses 18 through 19. This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Romans 11, 21 through 22, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Behold then the kindness and severity of God to those who fell severity, but to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. John 15, verses one through two, I am the true vine, my father is the vine dresser, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. 2 Peter 2, 20 through 21. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness and having known it, to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. Now, the last two are perhaps the most concerning. Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6. Hebrews 6, you know, that's, I think all of us have struggled with Hebrews 6. (coughs) For in the case of those who have once been enlightened, and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Hebrews 10, verses 26 to 29. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? and has insulted the spirit of grace. Now, these are the verses that Wesley uses, and he doesn't just quote them, he also goes on to explain the various points that are in there that would imply to him that a true believer can ultimately fall away and be lost. And I think we understand the impact that these verses can have on us. I mean, I think last time we were in the book of Hebrews, I don't know why I remember this, but... um, The point was brought up, how do we explain the idea he was sanctified by the blood of the covenant and yet he ends up being lost? Well, we have to be able to explain that, but let's move on with Turretin's argumentation or how he would approach this. So having stated the opponent's argument, the next thing that Turretin would do is state the question more precisely. What is it that we're really talking about here? And he might make some refinements to that initial question. Now, the question is not whether those who profess to be Christians or those who are members of a local church, a visible church, can fall away, but whether those who truly believe in Christ, the elect, ever can. And again, he would give the answer. The answer would be no. And then finally, he would argue his case from Scripture. By the way, there's a lot writing on this. We kind of take it for granted. But 
our eternal destiny really is riding on the fact that this is true, okay? Now, first he would refute the argument of his opponent, and that could take a long time if I go through these verses one by one. But let's deal with them all at once because they all have one thing in common. They are all referring to a particular sin that can be committed by a professing Christian but will never be committed by a genuine Christian, and that is the sin of apostasy. So what should we make of the one who was doing the right thing and so being characterized by God as righteous, but then who turns away from it to evil, who becomes shipwrecked with regard to his faith, that is a branch that is uh, cut off from the olive tree or from the vine, who escapes the defilements of the world only to be entangled in them again, who has been enlightened and tasted of the heavenly gift, been made a partaker of the Holy Spirit, and then fallen away, who receives the knowledge of the truth, was sanctified by the blood of the covenant, and yet goes on sinning willfully. You know, we can really explain all of these things by one verse of Scripture, where John writes in 1 John 2.19, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. The one thing that these verses all have in common is that they are referring to the sin of apostasy. And, and let's remember what an apostate is, okay? An apostate is not somebody you meet on the street, you try to share the gospel with them, and they say, I don't believe that, get out of my face, okay? That, that's an unbeliever, but it's referring to a person who receives what you have to say, okay, and who looks like they believe, and maybe even they do believe the facts, and they believe them so strongly, they come into the church, they become members of the church, and it's been said historically, they may even become bishops in the church, you know, hold high offices. I don't know how many times you've heard the testimony of a, of a minister, who had been ministering for years. And yet one day the Lord saves him and he realizes he had been unconverted that whole time. He had been preaching to others their need of Christ and he himself had not trusted in Christ. It, it does happen. I mean, think about the parable of the sower and the different responses. The guy on the street who rejects it, that's the, you know, the seed that falls by the wayside and the birds eat it up. But what about those two soils? The one that, you know, it... it it springs up immediately, but then the heat dries it all up and it doesn't bear any fruit or the plant looks really good and strong, the seed's growing, but then the thorns choke it out, the world and the desires of the world choke it out and it bears no fruit. What are those two, those two examples talking about? Those are talking about the sin of apostasy, okay? The very thing that these verses are talking about. The person embraces Christianity because they're convinced in their mind that it's true, and they may even have some of the, what we call the common workings of the Holy Spirit that convict them of this truth and drives them in that way. But the one thing they never really have is the Spirit of God working in their hearts to produce that grace of love that causes us to continue to hold on to Christ no matter what happens. And so what happens is that they may fall away in the future, leave the church, or they may remain in the church their entire lives and in the end actually be proven that they don't know the Lord at all. Now, the question is, how do we know that that is what these verses are actually referring to? Well, because the Bible says if they were genuine, they would continue to walk with Christ to the end, right? They went out from us because they were never really of us. Jesus tells us quite plainly in Scripture that he will never lose even one of his sheep, but he will bring them all to glory. Let me read a few verses on the other side of the equation. He says to, of his disciples, while I was with them, I was keeping them in your name. This is Jesus' high priestly prayer. Uh, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I guarded them. And not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. I guarded them 
and not one of them perished except for the one who was a devil from the beginning, who was not saved from the beginning. And then he speaks of his sheep in general. He says in our passage, and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. He also says in John 6, verses 37 and 39, all that the Father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. How many does Jesus lose? He loses none, okay? All right. And then Paul gives us several passages. He says in Romans chapter 8 that all the elect are going to make it to glory. Now, as I read this, remember, that as Paul moves from one category to the next, foreknowledge, predestination, you know, um, the idea of calling and so forth, that he picks up everyone from the first category, moves them into the second, all the people from that category into the next category, so that all who are foreknown by him reach glorification. He says in verses 29 through 30, for those whom he foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. If you look at the language carefully, there is no slippage, no leakage from one category to the next. And then he goes on later in the same chapter to tell us that there is nothing in heaven or earth that could possibly separate us from God. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And let me just read one last passage, Philippians 1 verse 6. Paul says that God will bring to completion the work he begins. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, we've got all these passages that tell us that all of Christ's sheep are going to come to him. He's never going to cast them out. He gives them eternal life. They will never perish. Okay. And nothing can separate us from God, uh, Paul tells us, nothing in heaven or earth, and that everyone who is known of God, foreknown, and that refers to election, if we had time, we could get into that a little bit more, is going to make it to further glorification, okay? We need to recognize this. God is perfect. God knows all things. God is absolutely holy. God cannot contradict himself. Would you all agree with me that that's true? God can't contradict himself. So he's not going to say one thing and then say another, okay? He's not going to say we're secure and then tell us we're not secure. The passages that Wesley quotes, they have to refer to something other than genuine salvation, something that is short of salvation. It refers to those who profess, to those who look like they have the reality, outwardly what we see. You know, because we have to ask ourselves that question. Well, this person was a Christian. I mean, they confessed faith in Christ and they fell away. I had a, a person that I, I really admired way back in, in my Calvary Chapel days who actually led me to the Reformed faith by letting me borrow some tapes from um, R.C. Sproul. And, and he was really, I mean, he was so dedicated not only to Christianity but to the Reformed faith. I mean, he... He went to work for R.C. Sproul. But today, he's rejected the gospel. He's denied it. We know other people who have done the same thing. How can that happen? Well, some people look at these verses and they conclude that a true believer can lose their salvation. The, The person didn't persevere. He had to persevere, and if he did, he would be saved. He would be, you know, enter into heaven at the end. 
But that kind of switches the, the onus, so to speak, on ourselves to keep ourselves in the grace of God through our works. That's not how it works, is it? God saves us, and then He makes sure that we persevere all the way to the end. He, Christ will not allow us to perish. He won't allow anything to separate us from His love. That's what we just read. So how do these people fall away? Well, again, John says they went out from us because they never really were of us. They never really trusted in Christ. They didn't have the Spirit of God. They were those two types of soil that looked promising. Until a trial came, they fell away. That's what the, um, the whole letter to the Hebrews is all about, is the temptation for these Hebrew believers to fall away in a temptation, which is, hey, if you reject Christ and go back to the Jewish church, then you'll be protected under Roman law. But if you remain a Christian, then you're going to be persecuted. You may be thrown into prison. You may even die. And there's a lot of professing believers that didn't want to do that. They didn't want to expose themselves to that risk. And so they fled back to the Jewish church, to the Old Testament types and shadows, and they rejected Christ. So they rejected everything that was assumed to be true of them because they were a member of the church. You know, there's that argument of charity, isn't there? You know, if somebody professes faith in Christ, they're a member of a church. You receive them as a believer. And they look like they have all these blessings, but they really don't because they never really have believed. Now, I think that's also reasonable in light of some of the other things that the Bible teaches that that remember, we were helpless. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. There was nothing we could do to save ourselves. And while we were in that condition, God had mercy on us. He chose us in eternity before the foundation of the world. He sent His Son into the world to become one with us, to live for us, and to take our sins upon Himself on the cross and die for us so that we might be justified. And while we were dead, He made us alive by giving us His Holy Spirit making us willing to come to Him. And once we came to Him, He adopted us into His family with all the rights and privileges that belong to Jesus. Now, having done all of these things for us, is the Lord then going to say, get out of my family? Are we going to choose against Him? We never would have chosen for Him except by His mercy in the first place. Is He going to withdraw that mercy so that we begin to choose against Him again? No, He's going to keep us. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. Okay, so this is the way that scholasticism would approach topics. And again, this is very simplistic in, in the way that they do it because they have to get into much more deep questions. And so deep questions require some pretty full responses. But they don't just stop there. They also say a little bit about what difference it makes. I mean, what difference does it make whether I believe that we can lose or we believe we can lose our salvation or not? Is it better not to know? Is it better to believe you really can't know? That's really the question of assurance, and we're going to look at that in a couple of weeks. Is it better not to know whether you're saved or not? Is it better to believe that you can fall away and lose your, your justification so that you don't become careless? You know, if you believe that it depends on you, you, you really do get to work, don't you? Sometimes it has that effect. I mean, why is it the cults are going door to door and, and we don't? It, well, for one thing, it's because they believe their salvation depends on their going door to door, and so they're going to go door to door. And we know our salvation doesn't, and so we don't. And another reason why we don't is because it's really not that effective anymore because so many Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons have polluted the well, right? The most effective thing is just getting to know people and sharing the gospel. Well, again, what we believe is going to have an impact on us, but really, what does the Lord want us to believe? Well, He wants us to believe the truth, for, for a variety of reasons, okay? In our passage, Jesus clearly wanted his hearers to know the truth about this matter. And you know that he actually said this in rebuking the Jews, but his disciples were there. They heard too. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Now, what was Jesus telling the Jews? 
He was telling them that they didn't know him and they were going to perish because they weren't listening to his voice and they weren't following him. But what was he telling his disciples at the same time? That they do belong to him because they did hear his voice. They were following him and they would never perish. And so as we look at our own lives, we ask the same question. Are we listening to Christ and are we following him? If we are, the same thing is true of us. We will never perish. Why is it important that we know that? So that as we go out to serve the Lord, we can have confidence, right? That whatever happens to us, the Lord is going to bring us safely to heaven. You know, if people abuse us, if somebody kills us, we're, we're fine, we're okay, we're good. As a matter of fact, we fall into the better category because as Paul said, to depart and be with Christ is very much better. But it also gives us the comfort that no matter what we have to face in life, you know, whether it's the struggles of, of, of health, whether it's particular sins that we struggle with, that no matter what we have to face, the Lord is going to be with us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And as a matter of fact, he tells us again in Romans chapter 8, he will use all these things that we have to go through for our good. So in the end, he will receive us. We don't have to be afraid of that day. Perfect love casts out fear. Let's, again, believe what the Lord tells us. Let's, well, let's do what we really are called to do, grow in love because that love is really the thing that convinces us that we really do belong to the Lord. All right, well, I hope this gives you a little bit of, of uh, maybe a taste of what scholasticism is about. Maybe uh, you want to learn a little bit more about it. Dr. Godfrey this evening is going to say, you know, you can do a lot, a lot worse than picking up a scholastic book and trying to work your way through it. By the way, I'm not recommending everybody go and do that. It's good to get the basics down before you go into the deep water. You have to learn to swim in the shallow end. But we like to, to dive into the deep end. Sometimes we can get into trouble when we do that because it's, sometimes it's hard to understand those things. But if you have reached that point, that's, that is the apex. Uh, that is as far as it goes uh, in theology is the, um, the scholastics. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we, as we um, prepare to come to the Lord's table this morning.